So once again we declare this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice. Amen. And we will be glad. Whether we feel like it or not, we will rejoice and we will be glad. We will be glad. Uh, scriptures, uh, I forget where it is, but it says, Awake my soul and sing, my great Redeemer's praise. I, I think it's one of the Psalms. But in any case, the writer was speaking to himself, and it's good to talk to yourself now and again. Awake my soul and sing, my great Redeemer's praise. You know, our soul just knows wake up when we wake up. In fact, when we get out of bed ourselves, we don't know when we wake up either. <laughs> it's another story. But awake my soul and sing, my great Redeemer's praise. And we have great cause this morning, great cause every day to sing the praises of our Redeemer. The one who came, you know, from the glory and splendor of heaven above, came to this earth, became a man, suffered, was rejected, and died a criminal's death for us, for each and every one of us. Died on that cruel cross to take the punishment for all our sins, all the sins of all mankind for all times, and to give us in exchange his righteousness. And that's when our, when our Father looks at us, that's how he sees us. He doesn't see us in our sin, because he has, he has put all the punishment for our sin on Jesus, so he sees us as his child, because we have believed the good news. Simply because we have believed the good news, we have received Jesus. To those who believed him, who received him, to those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, children born of God. And this morning, we're we so thankful. So Father, we, we give you glory this morning. We thank you for your love. That it wasn't just words, but it was action. You gave your only begotten Son, Jesus, that whosoever would believe in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. And he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. And, and this is eternal life, Jesus said. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you sent. So today we just give you glory that we know you, we, we, we have knowledge of you, Lord God, we have a personal relationship with you Lord and we thank you that your Holy Spirit indwells us lives in us we are your temples Lord God and today from the very depths of our temples from the very depths of that place where you reside Lord God we worship you with the spirit you have given us with the breath you have given us and from the life that you have given us this life everlasting this life that will go on to live for you forever and ever thank you Lord Amen, Amen. <coughs>
worship you because you are our Lord. Amen. We worship you, Lord, today because you are the God who came down, Lord, from heaven above. The King who gave his life for his people, Lord. Lord, who were lost, who had no hope, no future, Lord God, outside of you, Lord. Lord, we're just reminded this morning of the story, Lord, of the rich man and Lazarus, Lord God. And how the rich man ended up in that terrible place of judgment in hell, Lord God. Lifted up his eyes and he pleaded that someone would even give him a drop of water for his tongue. Pleaded with Abraham that someone would go and tell his family, warn them. Warn them of the future judgment. That was our lot. That was where we would end up without any doubt, unless you had come, Lord God. We had no choice, Lord God, unless you came, because we were destined for destruction, Lord God. But we thank you, Lord, that you came and you took the punishment. You took the punishment that mankind deserved for rebellion and disobedience. And you open the doors, Lord God. You open the door to heaven for those who would believe. And today, Lord God, we again remember the price you paid. We take the bread, we take the cup, and we remember the eternal price you paid when you gave yourself. You gave your body on that cross. You shed your blood. And you were raised to life again for our justification. So today as we take the bread and we take the cup, Lord God, we remember your death and we proclaim it until you come again in glory, Lord.
worship you. Hallelujah. Christ your risen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. You are alive and you live forevermore, Lord God. And because you live, we also will live, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Praise you, Lord. Yes, we sing hallelujah because we have caused you, because Christ is risen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And he lives forevermore, amen. They begin us by his spirit, and speaking to our spirits. And if he's been speaking to your spirit this morning, and you have something to share with the church, then please do. It's like a kind of anticipation. It's a Christmas Eve sort of joy. Yes, sir. It's about what's going to happen and what God is doing and what He's about to do. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, it's good to see folks again. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you last week. Uh, shaking off an hour. I seem to be an allergic reaction to dust and advanced sinus infection, which I never suffered from before. Um, I was reminded last week in, in prayer, I was reminded of a time uh, when I used to suffer terribly from tonsillitis. And from a child, I suffered badly from doses of tonsillitis. So bad sometimes I couldn't even swallow. And, uh, at one stage, I ended up in hospital with tonsillitis. And then I was reminded that one Sunday morning, uh, after I had come to faith and we'd begun to go to church, one Sunday morning I was so sick I couldn't go to church. And I'd, I'd be very sick before I'd not go to church. But uh, as the family went off to church that morning, I took up my Bible. And for some reason, I was drawn to the book of Job. And I read through the book of Job. And when I finished the book of Job, from my memory, what I thought was, I'm not so bad. <laughs> I'm not so bad. Well, you see all that Job went through. Now, I don't know what happened reading that book that day. That was almost 30 years ago, and I've never, ever suffered from tonsillitis since. Amen. Never, ever suffered from tonsillitis since. Now, in recent times, I've been suffering a lot from uh, chest infection and different things. And, you know, when these things begin to happen, you ask yourself, first of all, you know, and many years ago, I would ask myself, you know, what's going on? Am I doing something wrong? And then God reminds me, well, if you were to be sick every time you did something wrong, you'd never be well, you'd be sick all the time, and, and so would everybody else. Um, but last week again, I decided to read through the book of Job and to see if I could get any insight into this miraculous recovery that took place 30 years ago when I, I studied it in some depth. And although I'd like to be able to tell you today that I found that link between you know me being miraculously healed of tonsillitis and reading the book of Job, it's so hard to say, no, I didn't get it. I didn't get it, but I did get revelation from the study, and today I'm going to share with you what that is. Because, you know, reading God's Word, whatever reason you have for reading God's Word, it's never a useless exercise. It's always good. And when you study it, when you look into it, God always opens our intellect, He opens our hearts to receive. Now, in the opening verses of, the, uh, of, of um, chapter 1 of the book of Job, this is how God describes this man as servant, Job. 
uh, in Job 1 and verse 1 it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. And there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So obviously this man is, you know, blessed with uh, possessions, he's blessed with children, he's blessed in so many ways. And then the story goes on to say that one day, as the angels came before the Lord, that Satan came as well. Now I don't know, you know, how that's how that had been, uh, been allowed or been possible, but that's something that did happen. Satan came before God, and Job became the subject of the conversation. And um, it wasn't Satan that brought up the subject of Job, it was actually God. He said, look at my servant Job, and he is the most righteous man in all the earth. And in verse 9 then, Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And if we were to read on, we'd find that in a short period of time, Job lost all his livestock, he lost all his servants, he lost all his possessions, and then he lost his ten children. And so again, Satan comes back again, and he has another conversation with God, and he says, yes, but, you know, you have spared his life, you have spared his health, but touch him, and I guarantee you, he'll curse you. Strike his body with sores from head to toe. This is what Satan was allowed to do. To strike his body with sores from head to toe. And he ended up sitting in the ashes. Scraping his body with a piece of broken pottery. That's how bad he was. I don't know if you've ever had an itch. Or had a rash. Or had you know, a persistent itch. And scratching it and scratching it. And you know, you, sometimes you scratch it so hard it brings the blood. But that's nothing compared to what Job went through. Now I know that wives are always a blessing, but Job's wife wasn't a great help to him. And her advice to Job was to curse God and die. Don't live any longer in this mess. Curse God and die. And in verse 10, Job said, to, he said to her, in verse 10 of chapter 2, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So uh, Job still held on to that position in God. And then of course along came Job's friends and they weren't much help either. And with friends like this we find that Job doesn't need many enemies. So they came along and they sat quietly breathing with him for a while and then they speak and I can imagine the scene, you know, you know that we love you, our good brother, so what we have to say to you, we say with love. And if anybody ever begins a conversation with you with those words, just watch out. Because if somebody has to start a conversation with, you know that I love you, then it means they don't know that you know that they love you. And what they're going to say is not going to be uh, said in love either. Out of their love for Joe, they spend many chapters then trying to convince him that this disaster has come upon you can't come upon him because of some sin or other. Job, you must have done something wrong. God wouldn't have put this on you unless you did something wrong. Uh, you must confess your sin and turn back to God if this suffering is to cease. This is what they were actually saying. And Job listened. Because Job was a humble man. He listened. But he maintained his innocence. And when they were realized then, after many chapters, that they were getting nowhere, it says they fell silent. But if they did, along comes another one of Satan's little helpers, Elihu. And he came up with a solution. And he claimed that the reason Job was still suffering was because God was speaking, but Job wasn't listening. God is speaking, Job, but you're not listening. And if you were listening, this would be taken off you. And this argument again failed to convince Job, but it silenced him. And in the silence, God speaks. In the silence, God speaks. You see, while we're busy speaking to others, 
or even talking to ourselves about our issues and our problems, what's gone wrong in our lives, we can easily miss hearing the voice of God when he speaks because we're so busy listening to other voices. See, God speaks to Job, but instead of answers, well, he has his questions. He doesn't give many answers, in fact, and his questions, which Job cannot answer, only show Job's ignorance of who God really is. In fact, God spends the two whole chapters towards the end of the, of the book questioning Job on things that Job knows nothing about. The first question that God asks is in chapter 38 and verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? <coughs> and what were its bases sunk? Or, what, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for, jo for joy? Where were you, Job? Where were you? And of course, Job was dumbfounded. And he was dumbfounded with all the questions that God put to him. You see, if Job was ignorant of Earth's natural order, how could he understand God's moral order? And if he couldn't understand the workings of God's physical creation, how could he possibly understand God's mind and God's character? And of course, he couldn't. And God went on to ask Job several questions about the animal kingdom in order to demonstrate how limited Job's knowledge really was. And it's not that God was looking for answers from Job. You see, when God asks you a question, he's not looking for an answer. He already knows the answer. And it's not that he was uh, looking for an answer here from Job. Instead, he was trying to help Job to understand how little he knew about God. And helping him to understand and submit to God's power and his sovereignty. And only then could he hear what God was really saying. You see, sometimes we think we understand God. And sometimes we put God into this box. And because this happened, this is what God is doing. We don't have a clue. We do not have a clue. In uh, chapter 40 and verse 1, And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault, a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Now it's not wrong to talk to God when things go wrong. And he's okay with that. <coughs> but what is wrong is to argue or criticize Almighty God if circumstances don't change or answers don't come the way we want them or in the time we want them. That's not okay. When things go the way you want them, good. But when things don't go the way you want them, do you demand that he give you an answer? When your job becomes <coughs> tough, when you get sick, when someone close to you dies, when finances are tight, when you, when you fail or when unexpected changes occur in your life, do you stamp your foot and shout to God, why? What are you doing? Why don't you help me? What are you at? Are you sitting on your throne? Are you going on a holiday? Now God is okay with that kind of talk, but as we grow up in God, that's not okay. That's not okay. If a child comes and stamps their foot at you, the first time they do it, maybe it's okay. The second time it's time to tell them, that's not good enough. That's not the way you speak to me. And the third time, then, there has to be consequences, as Tom looks at the toe of his <laughs> boot. <laughs> what are you doing? Why don't you help me? Now, first of all, God is not deaf, and secondly, if you continue to speak like that to God, don't expect an answer anytime soon. You see, when we're about to complain to God for things we don't like in our lives, we must remember instead how much he really loves us. And if he did nothing else from us, for us, from the day we were born until the day we die, except show us his love that was manifest in giving us his son, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. What was Job's reaction when finally he got a chance to speak to God? In chapter 40 and verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once. I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no more. So what he was saying was, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. You have shown me how foolish I am to try and understand you. But I don't even understand how you created the, the universe. But I don't even understand Earth's order. How can I understand yours? 
Now we know that we are the righteousness of God and that we know. But in and of ourselves, we are no more righteous than Job was. In fact, we're not near as righteous as Job was in and of ourselves. But the question is, are you worse off than Job? And I know you're not. You see, we need to give God a chance to reveal his greater purposes for our lives. But we mustn't forget that they may not always unfold the way we want them, or in the time we want them, or even over the course of our lives. Until you end your journey here on this earth and go to be with the Lord in heaven, maybe your circumstances are never going to change. See, when Job listened to what God had to say, he realized that as a limited human being, he had neither the ability to judge God, who created the universe, nor the right to ask him why bad things had happened to him. God will always do what he knows best, regardless of what we think is right or fair. And there's no point in getting angry with God. I just, he's okay with that, he doesn't mind that, but there's no point in getting angry with God. We're foolish to think that we can stand up against Almighty God. And some people do. They believe they can stand up against Almighty God. But if they thought a little demon was running after them, they'd run away. In Job's conversation with his friends, he refused to repent. Because he didn't feel he had anything to repent of. He asked him to question himself, has some sin brought this upon you? He maintained his innocence. Elihu came to say, you know, maybe you're not listening to God, my friend. And that did silence Job, and he listened, he listened to God. And he did repent, but his repentance was not the kind called for by his friends. He did ask for forgiveness for secret sins. But these secret sins were questioning God's sovereignty and his justice. He repented of his bad attitude, and he acknowledged it. God's great power and his perfect justice. Because his power is almighty and his justice is perfect. And we sin anytime we angrily ask God the question, if you're in control, how could you let this happen to me? His word says, by his wounds I am healed, so why am I sick? He will provide my needs, so why can't I pay my bills? He'll satisfy me with long life. So why do my friends die young? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. So why do I feel all alone in this world? And these are real questions. And God is okay with us asking those questions. But any time we angrily accuse God of allowing bad things to happen to us instead of removing them from us, we actually sin. We sin. And when these things happen, like Job, we have the right to ask, but we don't have the right to get angry with God if we don't get an answer. We ask God, and if we believe God will answer, then we wait for the answer. Like Job, we sit tight until we hear God speak. And he will speak. He will speak. You see, when we get angry and accuse God of being a cruel master, we fail to understand that because we are locked in time, unable to see beyond today, we can't know the reason why things happen. And this is why we often choose to doubt instead of trust. And all God asks is that we trust him with our unanswered prayers. It's not that he has ignored us. He has not ignored us. We've asked for something, and maybe he says no, and we have to accept that. Maybe he says yes, but not now, and we have to accept that. And there are times when, we say, when he says yes, and it is now, and we give God glory for that. But we must not think that it's because we have worked up some formula, or we have done something good, <clears throat> because that's not the way God works. How did Job fare out in the end? Well, in chapter 42 and verse 10 and 12 and 13, we read, The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. God asked Job to pray for his friends so that they would be forgiven. Because, in God's eyes, they had done wrong by accusing Job. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. Now, I know some of my opportunity, but Job lost seven sons and three daughters. What about them? No, he didn't lose them. They simply went on ahead.
head of hair. And they will be the first to greet him when his time came to go to glory. You see, to think that Job lost his children is to think with a natural mind when God wants us to think with the spirit. You see, when someone close to us dies, someone who's a child of God, it is a great loss. But it's not a great loss to the person who dies. It's a great gain. It is a great loss to us. It's not a great loss to that person. And if we can see with God's eyes, if we can see with God's eyes and ask him to help us to see that it's not a loss to us either. Yes, there is a separation in time. But in time, we will see that person again. In time, we will live with that person forever. Forever and ever. But if we focus on the loss it is to us, we will grieve and we will grieve and we will grieve. And eventually we will be overtaken with the spirit of grief. So we must ask God to help us to see our loss from the point of view of the person who has gone on before us. It is their gain. As we bring this to a close, Job knew enough at this stage to understand the gotten best, even if he didn't understand why. Even if he didn't understand why. Really, the scripture doesn't tell us why God did this to this one man. Was it trying to prove something to Satan? We know that couldn't be. But one day, one day, we can ask him that. Why did this happen? And maybe on that day it won't matter to us. Because we'll see God in a whole new light, with whole new eyes. And we'll be so overtaken with joy. Francis spoke about joy, was it? Mm-hmm. That joy in his presence. And even that, you know, that, that sprinkling of joy we get when we come together as God's people and begin to worship him and lift up his holy name and the songs we've been singing earlier on, lifting up that joy that, that bubbles up inside of us when we take our thoughts off ourselves and begin to worship him. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come just as you are to worship. Because one day, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Many will confess that he is Lord and be with him forever. And many will confess that he is Lord and it will be the last thing that they will say to him because unfortunately they will be sent away to that place of suffering, everlasting fire. Because they didn't choose him when they could have. But one day, one day, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Every tongue will acknowledge that he is Lord. So Job knew that uh, to understand that God knew best, even if he didn't understand why. And this is where the rubber hits the road in our walk with the Lord. When we humbly walk with him without questioning where he's taking us. When bad things happen, we still trust a good God to bring good out, even if we never see it in our lifetime. And the more we understand the nature of God, the more we'll be at peace no matter what happens to us in this life. Job thought he knew God. But it was only when all the other voices were silenced that he finally heard God's voice. And when he did, wisdom and understanding came. We must know God, we must listen to him. And as we do, we must believe that he speaks because he does. And the more time we spend reading his word, the more we hear from him. In fact, being in his, in his word, reading his precious promises is the only way we can be sure that the voice we hear is God's voice. Because if we don't, all other voices will be in competition and we'll think it's God's voice and we'll have nothing to compare it against and we get deceived. And if we fail to attend to the reading of his word, then this voice that you hear as the voice of God may be a voice that leads you astray. I don't know how many times Someone has said to me, I'm not talking about anybody here, but I don't know how many times somebody has said to me, God spoke to me and he said this, and I'm thinking, no, God did not speak to you and say that because that's contrary to scripture. You see, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not the voice of God. Finally, in closing, I'm going to read two scriptures. One is in Romans 12 and verse 12 to 21. 
And in verse 12 it says, Rejoice in the Lord, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's a scripture we would do well to read every morning before we meet anybody else. Read it and meditate on it. And finally, in, I said finally three times now, in, in, in Romans uh, chapter 4 and verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice there that it doesn't say, pray and God will grant your request. Now, even though this may happen, but even if it doesn't, be assured of what it says, that as you bring your request to God, with thanksgiving, the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That peace that passes understanding and that peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and your mind until your prayer is answered or if your prayer is never answered. And I'd rather have peace any day. What about you? It is well with my soul. Is it well with yours? And if not, then go to that place where you find that peace that comes, that peace that passes all understanding. And trust in this God who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. And if he loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son and you can trust him for your eternal security, shouldn't it make sense to trust him no matter what's going on in your life right now? I know you're not sitting in an ash heap scraping yourself out of a broken pot. You're not. But I know wherever you were, it may seem to you that that's even worse. I don't know. But know this. God is with you. He's watching over you. He'd never leave you. He'd never forsake you. And like Job, it says the end of his days, he had twice as much as he had in the beginning. You don't have one wife, by the way. He didn't have two. I don't know why that is, but that is. But anyways, that's what we do. Anyways, God is with you. He never leave you. He never forsake you. Don't be anxious. Amen. So Father, we give you thanks today. That you care for us. You love us. You are true of us. And even though we don't understand sometimes what's going on in our lives, Lord, how could we with our minds? But help us, Lord, just to trust you no matter what. Just to follow you no matter where you're taking us from, knowing, knowing, knowing that you watch over us, knowing that you will bring us out and bring us through. And even like Daniel went into the lion's den, even if you don't, we will still trust you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.